Hi people, so I'm going to amalgamate two issues in this video. One is about the nature of ideological extremism and the other is about why I feel that green activists, extremists as I see them, um, but I'll say activists for now, um, are potentially just as dangerous as other extremists. Um, this is one of those things that, you know, can be uh, perhaps thrown around a bit and it is subjective. Um, you know, different people will define this in different ways. So I'm only offering my opinion here as to how I see uh, extremism as a concept. Um, because, you know, we, we hear about programs that are designed for counter extremism. I think it's important to, to consider what we see as extremist. Um, I mean, I have a pretty good idea of what I see as extreme, but it is abstract when you start getting into, you know, red lines and what, fix it, my pillow there, red lines and what, uh, you know, what sort of levels are crossed um, from holding a strongly held opinion versus going past that red line into an area you shouldn't be going down. Um, just a little bit of context here. LPC had a report on uh, Sherilyn Spade. Uh, she's the woman who um, got some degree of attention because she was charged with reckless driving um, when she had a confrontation with Insulate Britain activists um, in, uh, I think it was Dartford or Grays, I can't remember, last year. Um, now, I would say a sizable proportion um, of people commenting on this support her. I'd be confident in saying about 70%. That's speculative, but I'd say about 70% of people support her. And even among that remaining 30%, it's mixed between those who don't support her, um, but recognize the situation she was under. Uh, and then the minority are just outright against her. And a lot of them will be either Insulate Britain supporters or activists themselves. Um, anyway, she was speaking to LBC about uh, suffering PTSD. Now, that's something that could be diagnosed by a doctor, whether that's uh, whether she's exaggerating that or that's the case, I don't know, but I think it's very plausible. I mean, if you're going through months and months of legal uncertainty, you know, you are um, deprived of your livelihood for a year, because her job, as I understand it, or one of her jobs is actually um, moving around disabled children. Career, as I understand it, um, you know that's her livelihood. So that's going to have a very big impact, and it's uh, it's a whole year that she's had her license suspended for. Um, the case is ongoing. I, like a lot of people, feel this should have been thrown out. I feel that. Um, there's a strong, strong mitigating factor here. Now, it's very important to understand what happened in this case because uh, those who are attacking her, I think, are grossly distorting what happened. They're saying, oh, well, she drove over people. That is such a lie. Um, what she done was she gradually moved her vehicle forward. Now, technically, technically, she probably shouldn't have done that. But she has no record of dangerous driving. This is not a woman who is a threat to the public, unlike the um, people that were in her way. And, you know, I have a problem with talking about insulate Britain in the context of inconvenience, because I think that really downplays what they're doing. Um, in this case, she was trying to get her 11-year-old son to school, which is not a life and death situation. But there have been situations, empirically, where people have been trying to get the hospital, get sick relatives to hospital, that is potentially a life and death situation, and Insulate Britain have held them up. Now, I think that the way the authorities have managed this, for the most part, has been awful, because uh, until quite well into these protests, these actions, I'm even reluctant to call them protests, the police were pretty incompetent. I don't like attacking the police, but it's hard to give them much praise for this. And in this incident, they were nowhere to be seen. Now, why the hell were they not uh, arresting those two women and decided to block the road? Immediately. Immediately. They must have some tip-offs. Because I know that Internet Britain does that. They tell 
But, you know, they make it public what they're going to do. So the police had no excuse that they didn't know. Also, you'll have members of the public informing them. But I really do think the police need to explain their their failure to get hard line with these people. Um, and I do believe, I agree with others, that if they had done their job, arrested these people in the first place, it wouldn't have escalated. What we saw with Cheryl and Spade was a woman who was simply pushed over the edge. She snapped. She lost her temper. It's a totally human response. Um, and I defy anyone to judge her and say, oh, I would never lose my temper like that, really. Um, I think judging anger is uh, a very... It's one of the worst forms of judgment because anger is one of the most human of emotions. Even people who are generally calm will have a stopping point. Everyone does. And it's very clear that she was not running them over. She was slowly moving her vehicle forward. Probably she should have done something else. She probably should have gone and thrown water over them or something because then um, probably this case wouldn't even even gone ahead. Unfortunately, because a large vehicle is involved, that brings in another dynamic to it, rightly or wrongly. I personally think the case should be thrown out. I think there should be a strong mitigating factor in her defence. And I just hope her lawyers are working overtime to ensure that because there's serious implications here. If the police continue to be incompetent in dealing with insulate Britain, and in too many cases they have, it's not just this one, then unfortunately we're going to see more situations like this. And I think it's, it's going to escalate. Um, I read a report that uh, in, the, um, in the oil protests, it's another subsidiary group of in Extinction Rebellion, um, police were standing by and doing nothing. I mean, this is going to create a lot of cynicism and anger in the public. But anyway, not to digress. I believe Internet Britain are absolutely extremists, and this is why. Um, well, firstly, let's look at more kind of obvious examples, right? When you have terrorist groups, you get a group like ISIS, right? No one with any degree of common sense is going to say anything other than they are a vicious terrorist group. OK, their record is well documented, the sort of savage, evil things they do. You know, they drown men in cages, they force women into sexual slavery. They have been largely defeated, but they're certainly far from gone. As we know, they've been active in Afghanistan and um, they're, they're just pure evil. I mean, there's no way around it. Um, that, that's, you know, that's a no brainer. That is extremism in the purest form of the word. It's absolute dogmatic, fanatical, violent extremism. There's just no way around that. Unless you're a nice sympathizer. Um, then you get other groups. You get uh, blood and soil nationalist types of the Anders Breivik mold. Um, in Europe, that's been something of an issue and in North America as well. Although I would argue to a lesser extent than Islamic extremism. Uh, but, you know, in both cases, both... Um, sets of extremists are willing to use violence for their dogma, right? Um, in the case of the Islamic extremists, it's to spread the caliphate and force on believers to submit because they believe that's the way to get the caliphate. In the case of the blood and soil nationalist, neo-Nazi, um, their thing is about racial purity and they believe that minorities are a threat and therefore the objective is to end society. And they will, you know, do what they feel they have to to do that. Again, it's dogmatic, and there's a final, um, there's a final agenda there. Um, I was going to say final solution, but uh, yeah, final agenda. So in both cases, you have laws which, no matter how perverse to normal thinking people, is what they firmly believe. Is what they firmly believe. Now, people might cringe at me putting insulate Britain in the same definition of extremism. Uh, to be clear, I am not saying that insulate Britain are on the same level. But I think that uh, there is a fundamental danger with eco-extremists, which is that they basically believe they can do as they please, short of violence. But I say short of violence at this point. Now, 
They fixed Extinction Rebellion. There were offshoots. There was that incident at the Canning Town tube station. Actually, it was an overground station where the activists got on top of the train and it really angered people. Now, the main Extinction Rebellion group, it's not really a centralised group, although you had founders at Godra Hallam, um, distanced themselves from that. They didn't condemn it, but they said that the that particular action wasn't sanctioned. So you have these kind of, um, although, you know, all these activists will broadly have the same sort of idea about what they want to do. I think there will be people in the movement who know that, um, you know, they know it's not working. I remember um, someone I knew was involved in the Extinction Rebellion and she gave me a leaflet and asked if I'd like to, you know, join the group. And I told her very plainly, but politely, no, I don't approve of these tactics. And she agreed. She actually agreed. And she said, we need good people like you to have a voice of reason now. The idea of joining the likes of Extinction Rebellion would never cross my mind in a million years. I can't stand them. But uh, this woman's um, approach, the way she was saying this to me, indicated that there are people in those groups that perhaps know that they are utterly failing. But I think the moderate voices uh, are not being heard. And this is, again, something you can see in extremist movements where moderates get drowned out. Now, in the case of Extinction Rebellion, and particularly in Chile, and I think in Chile, Britain is worse, although there are some overlap there. Um, in the case of Insulate Britain, what you have is a group of people, and there's probably a hardcore of 100 at most. I reckon there's about 100 of them nationwide. And what they do is they get into these direct action legal tactics the thing about legality, incidentally, for an extremist, that's nothing to them because they see themselves as being in the same mold as suffragettes and civil rights activists. And their logic is, oh, well, they broke the law, so we're, we're just as good. Of course, in the case of the suffragettes, um, there's a bit of revisionism going on there because the more hardline suffragettes, the more militant ones, uh, you know, the sort of tactics they were employing, bombing MPs' homes, bombing letterboxes and so on. There was one incident in Dundee where they binded um, several postmen who were delivering parcels. Um, you know, they were basically terrorists. But people say, oh, well, the cause was justified. It was to give women suffrage. Um, but it's a false conclusion to say, well, they employed these extreme tactics and it worked. There's no evidence for that. I would say in the case of the suffragettes, it was a changing labour demographics of World War One that brought about change, at least as much as anything else. To say, well, the suffragettes planted bombs and women got the vote, it's just ridiculously simplistic. Um, that's important because when the likes of Inchelay Britain say, yes, we're breaking the law, but it's for a greater cause, it's because they see their cause as um, superior to the law. They see they sort of see it as, well, the law isn't really worth, who cares if our cause is justified. So they they don't feel any remorse at all for this, right? They don't feel any sort of sense of civic responsibility or in their mind, what they're doing is civic responsibility because they're saving the rest of us. And I would say this is another hallmark of an extremist to tell yourself that your cause is justified for the greater good, but to do it in such a way that you're your patronizing majority opinion. For example, I really believe that they take the view, well, yes, the public hate us right now, but they'll be thanking us in the future. I think that's how they see it. And that's very dangerous because it's utterly delusional. You know, I really, really, really don't believe that 20 or 30 years from now, even if we do have more floods, even if the temperature does rise, which is very plausible, I don't think people are going to say, oh, well, those insulated Britain people who were blocking roads in 2021, 2022 were right all along. I don't think that's going to be the case at all. Because they're not actually doing anything practical. They're not actually coming up with solutions. You know, they're not um, promoting sustainable businesses. They're not coming up with green inventions that can reduce carbon emissions. They're not doing anything productive at all at all. They say um, we're forced to do this because the government won't listen, but they don't listen to the public.
Um, so I think they're extremists in the sense that they have this dogmatic idea that everything they do is justified for the planet. Um, you don't get any bigger than the planet, right? The, the Earth, you don't get, you literally don't get bigger than that on this planet unless you're, you know, campaigning for space. So, in that sense, they've, it doesn't matter what the rest of us tell them, we can say we hit their guts, we can say they're hurting innocent people, we can say it's not working, it will fall on deaf ears because they have convinced themselves, they've convinced themselves they're martyrs, that they are doing the right thing and nothing anyone says to them will make a, an ounce of a difference. And that's why they're dangerous. Because if they can say to themselves, okay, we're justified in doing this, why not escalate it? Why not escalate it? I mean, their campaign has utterly failed, but they're not stopping. So what's to say that you won't get hardliners within Insulate Britain who would say, oh, we need to really wake up the public and sabotage railways? I mean, they could honestly take the view, if we bomb a railway, let's make sure it's empty, we won't kill anyone. Of course it could. This might sound um, dramatic, but I honestly think there is a real danger that, you know, they believe that the government is listening, that they, they cannot understand that the, this has failed. Um, so what's to say that they won't escalate? That's my real concern. Or you'll have a situation where they will be at risk because the public will be so, you know, I mean, what Cheryl and Spade done was totally understandable, but there could be more intense situations like that. People might resort to um, taking weapons. I hope it doesn't go that way. But, um, you know, you could get people pushed over the edge because what they have done is decided to target the public and they're proud of it. I think it's disgusting what they're doing um, and I have total contempt for them because they know this. I suspect some of them might be mentally vulnerable and I mean that without any flippant attitude. I actually do think some of them are um, vulnerable people who have been taken in by a kind of cult. It's a kind of dystopian doomsday cult we're all going to die in five years now i'm not a um, climate denier i do think there are very serious issues but i don't believe we're all going to die in five years and i do think there's a degree of alarmism in the climate movement um that doesn't mean i'm trivializing it i think the issues are very serious um you know i've got friends in the philippines which is one of many countries that is directly impacted by this so I'm under no illusions that there are real issues out there. My point is the likes of Insulate Britain do nothing. Even if, you know, the government gave them exactly what they wanted, even if this country was perfect in their mind, that won't, you know, the, the UK's overall emissions on a world scale is fairly low, much, much lower than China or the United States or Australia or India or a host of other countries. So even if we got to absolute net zero and done everything they're demanding, um, it wouldn't actually make a difference in an overall scale. I think we can always do more. I think there's too much plastic waste. Um, I think uh, energy sustainability is a very important issue. I think there's a lot of things that need to be looked at. But I do not believe that Insulate Britain is an asset to the green cause. I don't see them, uh, I don't see them as environmentalists, actually. I see them as people who are using the environmental movement as an excuse for their own narcissistic, um, reckless behaviour. So yes, I see them as extremists. And I think we need to recognise them as extremists. I think the government needs to prescribe them. There's one other point. When you get uh, neo-nationalists and Islamists, they tend to be young men. Not always, but they tend to be young men, angry young men. This is kind of the image of a terrorist, right? Um, with the eco mob, you know they don't. They look harmless. Some of them are pensioners, you know, retired vicars, and they're very middle England. They're very ostensibly harmless, and yet the harm they are causing is very, very real. 
this is why I think the claims of peace being peaceful really, really need to be scrutinized because if you're knowingly stopping someone getting to a hospital, if you know that your movement has caused a woman to have a stroke as it happened, yet you persist, what does that say about your intentions? To me, that says that you're malicious. If you know that you're causing harm, but you justify it to yourself by a greater good, I would actually say any movement, any movement that polarizes the public is doomed to failure. Even movements I support, for example, the Hong Kong protests of 2019, um, ideologically I supported 100% and dead set against communism. And I understand why young people there were so concerned and so angry about what the CCP was doing. But even in that case, there were some tactics that polarized the public, you know, trashing businesses and inconveniencing people unnecessarily. I'm not talking about the main protests because they, you know, they were massive. Um, and I think there's a difference between massive protests and widespread support versus a fringe protest. But, you know, um, some of the tactics that the Hong Kong protesters used, um, I think, were foolish. I think they only hardened the resolve of people who might have been wavering, you know, sort of didn't know whether they were pro-Beijing or not. Maybe if they saw, you know, activists trashing a, a Chinese shop owner's place, they might then think, well, uh, the Hong Kong protesters are just hooligans. That's not my view, but I think that um, if we're being honest, there was a hardcore element in there. Uh, and this is not, to, you know, I, I'm not saying it's a moral equilibrium. The CCP is a brutal totalitarian dictatorship, but you have to be sensible. You have to be sensible. I think I actually mentioned this to, I met a group of young Hong Kong activists in Newcastle and I said that like, I totally support them, but I did mention that the optics are important. So in any movement, any movement, you have to have the common sense to not polarize the public. Because as soon as you start showing contempt for democracy, going against the will of the people, deliberately inflaming public anger just for the sake of it, you know, it's not sensible. And I understand that there's parts of the world where there's some very backward attitudes and very backward laws. But again, it, it's better to be practical than just deliberately inciting for the sake of it. Um, I have enormous, enormous respect for human rights activists, people who take very real risks. But um, I think it's more practical to do it in a, in a way that doesn't incite just for the sake of it. You know, so um, that that's not that I don't sympathize with doing so. I just think it's practical. Um, you know, uh, as an example, in Thailand, um, I'll just close with this. You know, royalty there is not like in most other countries. It's extremely intense, um, somewhat less so since the last king passed away. But Thailand has notoriously harsh Les Majest laws which basically makes it illegal to criticise uh, the royal family. And um, you could go to jail for 15 years. And there is a hardcore of royalists. Now, many Thais are staunch royalists, but there is a hardcore of royalists who are not above using violence. So I think they're extremists. But in those situations, you know, people who want a Republican system or who are against the Majest, um I support them 100% ideologically, but, you know, I've seen, for example, um, crude pictures of the king uh, in kind of vulgar images and so on, and I think that sort of thing just doesn't really help. It would be better focusing on the free speech argument, better focusing on human rights rather than just being vulgar. Um, I think any movement has to be sensible. If I was heading a movement, you know, I would I would understand my responsibility. I think individuals have responsibility, but I also think if you're heading a movement, you have responsibility. In that sense, Roger Hallam of Extinction Rebellion is completely, not that it has a single leader, but he is one of the main founders, along with Greta Thunberg and others. Um, what they say matters, and they have said some very reckless things. Um I'll round this up, but um, I personally am utterly sick of green activists who hide behind their green activism, 
to do as they please, to show utter contempt for the public. Um, I think the policing bill that was brought in, um, people need to understand the context of that. It wasn't about banning protest. Protest is a democratic right. It's about recognizing that the public want action. Okay, the thing with Extinction Rebellion and Insulate Britain, prison's not a deterrent to them. They see themselves as martyrs. So I, I don't even know if prison's the best solution. I think, and that might be surprising coming from me, I think it's better to cut them off financially. Uh, in the case of those who, um, you know, there's people propose different solutions. Those that blew themselves for the road. Some people say just leave them there. Don't give them any water, you know. The problem is they are an obstruction, so you have to remove them. Um, I don't think it should be with kid clubs. I think they should be dragged off if their hands get damaged. That's their own damn fault. Maybe it will be a deterrent. Um, you know, this this method of using kid gloves, really, we need to get much tougher. In many countries, you know, if a bunch of idiots go onto a busy road, they will be dragged off in a heartbeat. They, there won't be negotiations. This is what's so perverse. This idea that we should negotiate with a minority, that we should allow a minority to basically hold a country to ransom. It's utterly perverse. It's undemocratic. It's um, infuriating. And I, I really sympathize with Sherilyn Spade because this woman, e even though, you know, the majority support her, she has been through uncertainty, you know, months of no doubt anxiety, wondering what her fate will be, if she might even go to prison. Um, for what? Because of a very human reaction in a split second. Um, I could understand, you know, if she'd driven over them, that would be going too far, but she didn't. She didn't. This is the point. And there has to be a mitigating factor in there. Um, and I think it is. A, I think it's a statement about our society that we've allowed our democracy to be hijacked by a minority of extremists. That's what's happened. We need to get much more robust with these people. It, it just when you start allowing a minority to dictate. That's what it is. It's a tyranny of a minority. And as for journalists like James O'Brien, who make false claims that like they've been arrested for protesting, Walter O'Brien, they were arrested for breaking the law. That's what it is. There's a lot of distortion around this, uh, around those who want to seek to make excuses for them. I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks for watching.